prizes. And then really quickly, the judging criteria, things our judges um, are going to be looking for is uh, how close you are to the theme, which are, if you aren't aware, the theme is on-chain privacy. So uh, hang on to that one. Um, creativity, wow factor, and completeness. So is it a demo? Is it a working prototype? Is it just an idea you wrote on a piece of paper and came up to present? That's totally valid, but probably won't get you as many points in this particular category. Um, great. OK, cool. Uh, I think that's everything I had. Uh, I'm going to put on, I think we're going to put a movie on here and here. I'm going to say let's give it like, let's give it half an hour and then we'll put a movie on. And then after that's over, we can start playing LARP. So maybe like LARP in about an hour downstairs in Siquiaros if you want to do that. That sounds good. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Too hard to come on that time. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to get started on the hackathon. I'm trying to pull up the um, information on judging stuff in case you forgot, but I can walk through what I remember of it. Um, so there's four things that uh, maybe I should introduce our judges. Um, we have Juan Carlos from Spiralis, who was very instrumental in helping get all of the stuff done and organized for the hotel. Um, we have Dulce, who is the leader of Liberaria de Satoshi, one of the premier education, Bitcoin education organizations in LATAM. Um, and también tenemos uh, Peter Todd, um, who's quite famous for his work in the Bitcoin space. Um, Peter, is it true that you coined the word coin join? Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's so, that's so cool that you were here. Uh, sorry. Okay, let's go. It's an amazing name. So the um, the inventor or coiner of the term coin join is our third guest. Um, cool. Okay. So one thing that uh, one second. Right, careful not to say my password out loud. Um, uh, okay. So how this is gonna work is we're going to they have the judges have four criteria. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna do the display thing. Um, they have four criteria, which are uh, how on theme were you? Um, were you on the theme? How creative is your project? Um, and I'll put them up here. Your wow factor, whatever that means, judges get to decide. Um, and then how complete is your project? Is it an idea? Is it a demo? Is it a working prototype? Um, man, my computer really doesn't like this. Uh, great. Okay, so um, I know there's not. I know a lot of people already had to leave, so we're a pretty small group. Um, but this is definitely not working for me. That's that's fine. Um, so great. So if you're going to present, I think maybe it'd probably be nice if we had like a little bit of organization to do this, but we don't. So if you're going to present, um, if you want to come, maybe I don't know if line up. Well, hmm. Okay, who's going to present? How many teams do we have? Is there names? Okay, so what's your team name? Thanks. Hourly. Okay, we have hourly. Um, what's your name back there? I'm sorry. Dad's beans. Okay. Um, three is Kimas. Is that it? We just have two. Three, Chris. Start nine, okay. And then I'm also going to show something off if I can get my computer. Oh, hey, it's working now. I've got a small thing. I'm just going to say Nifty's, I don't know, we'll call it Merkle TX. Merkle TX. So that's four people. Is there anyone else? That's it? So then it's Nimbus Quattro. Okay, great. Okay, um, Hourly, do you guys want to start off? Oh, everyone has four minutes to present, so. So this should take us about 20 minutes, which is great. Thanks. OK. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> hey, everybody. Yeah, um, this is our project. It's called Harley. Uh, Harley and this is designed to address a problem we, we are, I think we already have in the space. That is, it's about to, uh, it's about getting paid Hardly use, using Bitcoin, but th in a in a private in a private way. Um. Does anyone have a uh, 
Mac uh, HDMI, Mac HDMI, no? I need to plug an HDMI cable into, or USB-C will be fine. <coughs> yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I, I've been working on Hourly off and on for a few years. It's basically uh, started as a time tracking tool for Git developers, or developers that use Git. And it's I'm trying to turn it into like a payments kind of utility. And um, an issue has always been like the privacy side of it. So basically, uh, I'll just show you how Hourly works using Hourly's own repo. So, oh, excuse me. So, uh, hold on. So basically, like Hourly uses Git as a communication channel, and it basically treats Git as like the canonical proof of proof of work or proof of labor. So the, the main insight is basically like when a developer sits down, they clock in um, with hourly, basically just creates a git commit, and they commit other work, and then they clock out. Um, and so I've been generating invoices from this, or like timesheets from this tool for a few years. I have like over a thousand work sessions. Um, so I'm just gonna wrap it, or speed it up here. Uh, but the issue was always like, how do you, uh, so I, I added a lightning invoicing component to, um, oh, geez, this is huge. Uh, at TapConf a year ago. And the issue was like, how do you communicate that invoice um, to your, your client if you're putting the invoice on Git, uh, if you're using Git as the communication channel? So um, today we basically sat down and we, we thought like, well, what if you, you, you add a public key and a private key to, like you add a private key in your environment variable and a pub key in the Git repo and a pub key for each developer and for the person who's willing to pay the developers. And then basically um, we take the private key of the developer and multiply it by the pub key of the uh, the client, the person paying them, and that gives you a shared secret. So, and the the, uh, the client can do the inverse of that. They can take the developer's pub key and multiply it by their private key. So two can create a shared secret, and then they use that to encrypt um, a uh, the invoice. Um, so the developer encrypts the invoice, commits it to the Git repo. So that's what we just. We just added, so we added this encrypted invoice, and then both, uh, so then the uh, client pool, like does the next pool, sees the invoice, decrypts it with the shared key, and then pays the invoice over Lightning. Um, so we basically had all the <laughs> scaffolding working, we connected to the PlebNet Playground, and the um, issue was that, uh, you know, we just ran out of time <laughs> implementing it all. So we think it'll work, and it's, um, I'm looking forward to getting paid for my time in SATS. Um, so do you want to add anything? To oh, I have time. That's probably good. OK. <laughs> That's probably good. Um, if you go to the hourly repo in the BTC++ branch, you'll see where we've been developing this prototype. It's just in the docs, in the freelance section. Yeah. So this just shows like generating the private key, loading it, uh, pub key, multiplying them, getting the shared secret, encrypting with the shared secret. So this is uses for name encryption. And then um, and then a bunch of bugs that didn't quite work. <laughs> but essentially then like we one paid the other. And uh, uh, yeah, I think it that's pretty much it. Any questions? So, what would you say is the advantage over like sending a friendly email? Uh, yeah, so email is not that private, but it's also the goal is to actually automate this eventually. So, like, once you've got a good working relationship, the developer's not totally screwing you over, um, then you might, we could do things. So, basically, I want to be able to clock in, like, do some work, clock out, and get paid. Uh, instantly, and so basically, there's like 
yeah, we could, you could use other communication channels, but I kind of wanted to stay under like the discipline of, our, we already have one channel that is the canonical source of truth for the labor, so why not also, you know, use that for the invoicing? Does your tool PHP sign the git commits? Uh, not yet. <laughs> you should. Yeah. And you can open timestamps them too. Yes, <laughs> uh, people have told me I should use open timestamps for that. I mean, I like to say that hourly is uh, precise but not accurate. So it's like you could always be lying about the time you did. And even if you uploaded to open timestamps, there's no guarantee that that commit was actually done by the developer. So I'm not sure if it's overkill. Um, but until I get more users and feedback. I mean, like PGP signing, it proves the developer part. Open timestamps, I know, in sort of rare cases might be kind of useful. But the PGP signing is the important part. Yeah, it, it, it proves that you had the private key that signed the code, but it doesn't prove that you were the developer who wrote the code. So that's always like... Well, the developer magically made it happen. Yeah, <laughs> they made it happen, and, you know, maybe that's all we really need, you know? I, and if you do... Slightly, or if you do get to the point of ever bothering with like time stamping or stuff, remember you can use things like Bitcoin block hashes to prove something was created um, after a point in time. Yes, yeah. Um, and there's a lot of kind of, I make mistakes when I use my own tool, like I forget to clock in or clock out. So I, I've added things like you just add T minus an hour if you forgot to clock in an hour ago. So there's a lot of things that are already like, you're relying on the humans to be honest with what they're doing with their time, but this is just allowing people to be more transparent if they want to be. And you c it's also, you know, it's in the chain of Git commits, so anyone can audit it. If you're, even if you're not getting paid to do the work, I think it's important so that next time, if you ever do spin a company out of like one of your open source projects, it's very clear like who did put in the most sweat equity and so forth. Start doing everything from scratch instead of using open source project already done and like uh, there is a well there was no there was no time tracking tool that was based on Git that didn't rely on a third party like or, or a database structure so um, as far as I know I'm the only project that started that um, I don't even know how many other people use it but it's just I found it useful for me yeah, go ahead. Are you planning to uh, so we yeah we do um, basically. We plug into PubNet Playground as, it's like a signet uh, that mimics the Lightning Network and Bitcoin. And so the, the payment invoice is generated by LNCLI commands, and, but you could also use CLN. And um, the key thing is that like, you have the invoice payment plus the clock in hash and the clock out hash so that the client can, uh, or the, you know, the person paying you, can figure out like which commits are sandwiching for that work session. So they can generate like a diff and a summary and like validate your work before sending the payment. Uh, and of course third parties could come in and help with that. So yeah, it's all kind of works. <laughs> but um, so you could ahead. actually make a module for BTC pay server and, and for everything yeah. like for any any kind of thing that just just clock and BTC pay. Yeah, BTC pay server is already in hourly. Um, I added that like two years ago. There's also Stripe invoicing. It's just that there wasn't. I, I added the BTC pay server stuff before they added Lightning payments, so I just didn't get around to including that. I, we could have used that route, but it's more that you know, it's like you know, we spent a couple hours on this today. It's not like insanely hard to add you know new payment mechanisms. It's just the key thing was like figuring out. What's the important information that keeps you private when you're dealing with a very publicly accessible, you know, Git repo, or what could become a, a publicly accessible repo? So um, that was the main uh, difficulty here. Thank you, guys. Ooh. Thank you. Hackathon. I tried to integrate Bitcoin payments into a hobby store that I'm running for my dad. So my dad, is uh, his hobby is roasting beans. Uh, he started this about four years ago. He got really good at it. And, you know, I've been sending them to my friends and coworkers, just calling it dad's beans. <laughs> 
and the name stuck. So now I'm like, okay, this is uh, kind of for real now. Uh, so this is like a, a Next.js project that I deployed to Versal really quickly. Um, all the state management stuff works, uh, but I can't really, uh, I can't really prove it. Um, oh shoot, actually this one pr might not work. Uh, yeah, it worked before, just trust me. Um, but uh, the, the Bitcoin part was uh, what I worked on the last 24 hours, which was like, okay, how do I integrate Bitcoin into this? And so I started down a couple of different paths. Like one was PlebNet Playground, but I didn't really follow that through that well. Uh, the other one was like going through um, BTC Pay Server, which I was able to set up a, a wallet. Um, and um, th there's another tutorial out there that I have to follow. This is like integrated all like together. Uh, but the idea is once that's done, you'll be able to order my dad's home roasted beans uh, and pay in Bitcoin. So if anyone wants to do that, that would be great. Support my dad. Thank you. Any questions? Where's the privacy in your project? Uh, there is no privacy in the project. <laughs> Or maybe the privacy is that. Uh, well, the privacy is like you buy beans non interpreter. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or, or. The CIA doesn't need to know what my beans are. The, the government doesn't need to know that you're paying for my dad's beans. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. What's up, guys? Uh, there we go. Um, hey, I'm Chris Guida. I work for Start9. Um, I was inspired to work on this um, after seeing uh, Sergio's um, presentation on the Eye of Satoshi uh, CLN Watchtower plugin. Um, basically, i kind of been thinking of doing this for a while, <laughs> which is just adding the Eye of Satoshi plugin to Embassy OS. Um, I wasn't able to actually um, uh, test, test this, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, because I, I didn't actually bring an embassy device to test it on. Um, and the package file is unfortunately like 500 megabytes. Um, and so uh, I have a VM that runs embassy OS, uh, but the VM has been off for like a month and I was trying to sync Bitcoin <laughs> to test it. And so I can't test it. Um, so I'll just show you the PR. <laughs> if anybody wants to learn how to package things for embassy OS, um, I can show you how to do it. It's actually pretty easy. Uh, so. Basically, uh, you know, we just add a sub-module for the new plugin. Uh, in this case, Rust TIOS, which stands for I of Satoshi. We add some things to the Docker file. Uh, here, we're copying the code in, and we're building it uh, using Cargo, because it's Rust. And then in the final stage, we just copy the binary from the builder um, into the final image. And then, um, yeah, the, the rest of the time, I just uh, waited for this, this build to complete, because <laughs> Uh, this Docker file takes, it builds CL Boss from scratch, and it builds uh, Lightning D from scratch, and it builds everything from scratch. So it takes, um, basically I needed, and the binary contains an x86 Docker image and an ARM image, because now we support Raspberry Pis and x86. Um, so it's actually a, like a, what we call a fatty, <laughs> a, fat, a fat package, <laughs> um, because it supports um, uh, multiple different architectures in the same package. Um, anyway, so I built that on both of my machines and packaged it all together, together and I swear to you, I have a package it builds. <laughs> I just have to run it somewhere. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's all. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, so the Eye of Satoshi is a watchtower. Um, and so on the Lightning Network, that's just, you know, you send it uh, information that it needs uh, to look for on the blockchain. And as soon as it sees something that uh, basically proves that one of your channel counterparties is trying to misbehave, it publishes the, uh, the justice transaction and um, claims all of the money in the channel for you. Um, and then, like, possibly in the future, you could split the money with the Watchtower, but right now I think you just get all the money. I don't think the Watchtower actually gets any money for doing this, so it's sort of an altruistic service. But yeah, basically it's um, security for, for your Lightning channels um, in case you happen to go offline and one of your channel counterparties decides to publish an old state and claim money that isn't theirs. This one just works on Core Lightning. Yeah, this this is the IF Satoshi. It um, it only works with Core Lightning nodes, uh, but it uses a similar Watchtower protocol as what LND and I think I don't know if Eclair has a Watchtower. So, but yeah, they all kind of apparently have similar uh, protocols. Thank you. Somewhat. Now I'm gonna scroll up to let something no one can read that. Oh no. Okay. Uh let me like just open up a new thing. I can oh I can't. Oh, okay. Okay. What? <laughs> are you are you diving me? Okay. Um let's see. Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I apologize. I um uh, yeah, so this isn't finished yet, but I, I'm going to, yeah, agree. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to try to explain what I'm doing really quickly. Okay, so how many of you are familiar with transaction data about outputs? How many of you guys played the LARP? So everyone who played the LARP? Okay, so you know in the LARP, whenever you're trying to figure out how much to pay in fees, right? How did you, you had to go look up. You had to go look up the input, right? The input information, right? So you had to go look up how much the amount, you had to go look up the previous output for the output amount, it has an amount and it has something that we didn't talk about called script pub key, right? Um, so this is like, so you have to go look up a previous transaction, right? And that's a lot of data. So Yuval, who's, who's here, had this idea, what if you were able to use Merkle roots to um, make a Merkle root of all the outputs of a transaction, and then when you wanted to look up a single output, you could have a magic little server that you would send it something that I'm calling the Merkle transaction ID, and the v, v out that you're looking for. So I have to have a server that can take a request for the Merkle transaction ID and of something that I'm calling a V out, and this would return to you. It would return to you. Um, I have to remember what it would send you back, but it would send you like a Merkle proof and it would send you the data that you requested, which was the amount and the script pub key, right? Okay, and so then you would be able to take the Merkle proof. Is it return a root? Mm, I need a Merkle root somewhere maybe. No, I think that's okay. It would send back a Merkle proof and the data that you wanted, right? And so you would be able to take the data and the Merkle proof and prove that this data was included in the Merkle TX ID, right? So that you knew that you got the right information. But the whole point is that this amount of data that you're getting back from this magic server is much more compact than the entire transaction. So this doesn't have a whole lot to do with privacy, but it has a lot to do with compact, getting back compact data instead of having to pull out the whole transaction, you could get a lot less information, if that makes sense. And the size of this Merkle proof, I think, is log, is like 32 bytes times log of the n, log of the number of transactions that there are. Okay, um, so I don't actually, I haven't actually finished my, um, uh, I haven't actually finished my implementation, but I was working on implementing it in Python, um, where basically we came up with a hash scheme for all of the, so you may take all the outputs in a transaction and you would build a Merkle root from these um, with a little leaf and then a branch thing. And so I kind of copied, I don't know if it's open, but if we go to vault12.org, oh no, am I like way over time? I'm sorry. Um, Bolt 12 has a signature calculation where they build a Merkle tree. So I kind of copied how 
bolt 12s as Merkle roots for this. So that's a little bit of cheating on my part. Um, yeah, and so the idea is that you can get a root and you could verify the root. So there's a method to verify a root given the transaction ID you have, which output you're looking at, the data that you got back with the amount in script pub key and the proof that the server sent you. And so this would tell you whether or not that was correct. Um, and then I was working on um, given like a whole list of input dates. So these are all the output data, given a whole bunch of output data, building a proof and a, um, a root. So you could build a proof basically. Okay, it's like it's a very complicated project. It's like very incomplete state, but that's what I've been working on. Great, okay, are there any questions? So how, uh, like, have you thought about how you could go reduce the trust in the server? Mm. What do you mean? Sorry. Like, my understanding is you're asking some entity yeah. who's created all this. Have you thought about how you can reduce the trust in them? Uh, so I think, so my scheme assumes that, um, it assumes that when you pull the transaction, you get something called a transaction, like a Merkle transaction ID, which includes the, so when you get the transaction, it would, compute the Merkle root for it and include that in like a transaction ID thing somehow. You make a transaction ID that also covers the Merkle root of all the outputs. And then, um, oh, you would be able to verify that the Merkle transaction ID was, would you be able to? No, maybe not. I feel like there was a, mm, okay. I need to go back and think through this. There was something where like, you'd have to have a new transaction ID that you're requesting. Oh, there's, so you use something called the Merkle transaction ID of the current transaction, which includes, hang on, I think I might have that wrong. Basically, you'd have to come up with a new transaction ID that includes the Merkle root in it, right? So that that becomes the thing that you're communicating. I'd suggest you look at uh, the thinking behind compact block, or not compact blocks, um, neutrino, yeah. Like okay. how um, neutrino servers can be checked against each other. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Cool. Any other tr questions? This is like got to work on my trust on the server. I don't know anything about Utrex, so to be completely honest. Then, like, I guess it's pretty similar. Maybe. As it's like, yeah. I mean, the only description I know of Utrex is like Merkleize all the things. Um, so if they're mercalizing all the transactions, then th that would probably be something you yeah, could easily plug into. Yeah, it takes like forever to sync because mm -hmm. you have to make um, mercalize all the transactions, mm -hmm. and it takes like five months to do that. <laughs> okay, but I think it would be cool to do it faster. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, this like this like thing I was working on is like kind of hacky and clearly has trust problems. I have to figure out. Um, uh, you would only be Merkleizing the output data. So that might be a little bit faster because that's all you care about, at least in this like very small scheme, right, is looking up the output. It's like another zero conf thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> cool, okay. Well, that's impossible to read, that's annoying, okay. Okay, that's all I have. Uh. Oh, we have one more question, okay. Sorry. This is, like, this, is, this is not that impressive. Hello? Yeah, um, I guess this is a question for Peter. So I guess <laughs> <laughs> I, wa I just wanted more details about the compact block thing. Are you talking about the filter headers or are you talking about actually checking when you get different filters? Um, Yeah, I'm thinking of Neutrino too. Yeah, yeah so this is compact. This is um, block filters, right? Yeah, block filters. Yeah, so they have, so they have um, the filter headers, and they have uh, <laughs> just comparing, uh, like if you get two different filters from two different pe peers for the same block, then you.
then you have to go back and like calculate the filters yourself. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, there's, there's strategies people have written up on like, what, what, what would you do about that kind of comparison? And, you know, I mean, maybe you could go even punish that kind of thing. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different possibilities there, but at the very least, just like thinking through what it looks like to compare, compare two different peers and see what they say is a good start. Cool, yeah, I, I remember trying to do that and it's computationally like really infeasible unless you, um, unless we add the, the filter headers into the Coinbase transaction, there's supposed to be a soft fork to do that. Yeah. Oh, I think my idea was that you'd have like a new transaction format that the input included the Merkle root of the outputs and then, and then there would also be like a new transaction ID for that transaction that you've created that would so you're potentially like proposing a soft fork. Yes, correct. I'm doing that. Yes, I'm doing that. That's what I'm doing. That one. Yes, that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That should, I mean, be, that should be pretty easy to activate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, that that one. Yes. Um, right. But that would that way you would have um, you would have the Merkle roots committed to in the transaction ID of sorts that you used to look stuff up. So it would all be. You, I guess you're then you're trusting the person who composed the transaction and signed it. So I guess if your signature covers it, you're okay. Well, okay. if it's consensus rule, you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hand wave, you know, it's, it's a minor soft work. So there's a low sound nice way to work around this, which is if you take, kind of like in ZK Starks, a transcript of the computation going into this. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're taking a legacy transaction, parsing it, representing every step, every intermediate step, and then Merkleizing that transcript and randomly revealing nodes from that based on the final output. Um, there's a paper that talks about like, it's kind of like the non, the nipopos, what's that, uh, non-interactive proofs of proof of work. Um, and it's not cryptographic soundness, but you can get something that is still strictly better than just like hoping that one of your peers is honest and then if you're seeing an equivocation, like redoing the work yourself, uh, at least in, in theory, it's possible. Uh, of course, sometimes these things can be strictly better in the sense that eating off a toilet that you've put some bleach on is strictly better than eating off the toilet without the bleach. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks guys. I think I'm the last one. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so I think we're gonna give the judges, how much time do you guys want, 15 minutes? to go huddle in maybe downstairs in 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, quick, so quick coffee break, I guess, for 10 minutes. And then when they come back, we will announce the winners. And yeah, we'll see what's. Who said that just left, uh, Peter and me, we assigned the prices in the following order. For the third spot, we have... Start nine. We're giving you stuff electronically. Like, if you want an oversized check, give it to us first. <laughs> okay. I'd like to thank the Academy. Oh. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, Sorry, uh, what? Thanks. <laughs> what one? Uh, okay, okay. For the second prize, we have from... Dad's Beans. <laughs> Bear Market Beans, to be exact. Be Bear Market Beans, yeah. We, we request that you change the name. Yeah, yeah, bull market beans, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, for the first prize. Hourly. <laughs> Actually, much of the decision was made of the, the theme that Lisa emphasized this morning. They were the closer to doing kind of something kind of private. Let, so. let, let's be clear, Lisa did get full 10 points for Audacity of entering in her own competition. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, Audacity was one of the categories. <laughs> okay guys, congratulations. So the trip is for the guys over there. Yeah.
Good job, y'all. Um, so does that yeah. include um, my family as well? Ellie and the kids? Uh, I don't know. There's a budget. We, we, we will <laughs> see the budget fits. And, uh, um. and so we would really like Jimmy, that is back there, that I don't know if you talked to him, but he's not really into the Bitcoin business at all. So he's coming here to meet people. He works in the tech space. So I think that if you talk from zero to 10 in learning, he would be the one winning in this case. Nice job, Jimmy, yeah. Second I know that time. because I had some lunch with him and I'm like, what are you doing? I said, I just came here to learn about Bitcoin. I don't know what, no one. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. Thank you very cool. much. Thanks Thank you.